Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to lecture 14 in CS 151. Um, as always, if you find typos in my slides, which I'm sure are there, send an email to uh, mfrick at unm.edu and let me know so I can fix those. This is version one, the first version of these slides. So last time we looked at various sorting algorithms. Um, in particular, we dissected bubble sort and we talked about how to describe the relative speed of different algorithms. So we came up with this O notation, um, which relates the time it takes to solve a problem to the size of the problem. So with sorting, as the number of elements you need to sort goes up, we measure how long does it take for this particular algorithm to sort those items. So um, with bubble sort, the time it takes to sort the items increases as the square of the length of the list to be sorted. We also looked at some other algorithms like merge sort and quick sort just quickly, and we saw that they are order n log n. So they, the growth time with respect to problem size grows much more slowly. And we discussed how quick sort, um, even though its worst case behavior is n squared, just like bubble sort, is on average faster than merge sort. And I want you to think about that for a second and how it could be that something could on average be faster even when it's big O of n squared. So I want you to think about the definition of what big O means versus what average means. So merge sort and quick sort are faster than bubble sort because they use the same kind of divide and conquer strategy as we saw in binary search. So you'll, I hope you'll start to see that um, various parts of the course are coming together here. Um, we looked at functional programming, and it may not have been clear why functional programming was so important in computer science, um, but recursion is certainly something you're going to see a lot of, and recursion underlies both merge sort and quick sort. All right, so let's start developing merge sort. Um, we're going to think like a functional programmer and use recursion. So our usual process is to think of a base case and then the recursive step. Now, the base case is going to be the simplest version of the sorting problem that we can think of. In this case, it's going to be very simple. So the simplest version of sorting is we have one element. We have a list with only one element in it, and we'd like to sort that. To sort an element of a list with this one element requires no work. Right? So let's think about a recursive step next. How do we take that um, single element sorted list? And I'll come back to that later in the, in the lecture. How do we take that single element list and then assume that's sorted and expand um, to grow our problem size. So this is our usual process. We find the smallest problem we can solve, and then we come up with a method for taking um, smaller problems that we assume are already solved and putting them together so that the slightly larger problem is solved. All right. So with merge sort, not surprisingly, the strategy we're going to use to, sort, to merge or to put smaller already solved problems together is called merge. All right, so we're going to take two sorted lists that are smaller um, than our initial uh, list size, and we're going to put them together so they're still sorted with this merge function that we're going to write. So merging is at the heart of how merge sort works, and we're going to use it to define the recursive step so that we can solve larger and larger problems. And eventually, like with all recursive algorithms, we're going to bottom out on that base case where we just have one element and then sort that one element, which is trivial, and then start putting everything back together as we return from the recursive calls uh, using our merge function. All right, so let's set this up a little more formally. Merge is going to do the following. Given two lists of sorted items, it's going to create a new list containing the same items that is also sorted. So we're going to work with three lists here. The two lists we are merging and the output list that we're going to return. Um, and I want to point out there are lots of different versions of, of merge sort. 
I think this particular version I'm going to show you is, is really quite elegant, um, but it requires three lists. All right, so step one. We're going to take the first item in list one and compare it to the first item in list two. We're going to move the smaller of the items at the beginning of each of these lists to the end of the output list. We're going to repeat this process, so you can guess there's a while loop or a for loop coming. We're going to repeat that process until one of the lists is empty. And we're going to put whatever remains in the non-empty list at the end of the output list. All right, so let's go through an example. Imagine that we have two lists that are already sorted. And we want to perform this merge operation on them. So we're going to compare um, the items at the beginning of each list. And we're going to ask, is 7 less than 3? So min will just return the smaller of the two items. So we're going to say, which of these is smaller, minus 7 or minus 3? Well, minus 7 is smaller. So we're going to put that at the beginning of our output list. Initially, our output list is going to be empty. And we're going to start building it here with this merge operation. We now compare 5 and 3. We find that 5 is smaller than 3. So we're going to put that at the next position in our output list. And we continue this process. So we're going to compare 1 and 0. 0 is smaller than 1, so it goes next in the list, and so on. Now, one of the lists is empty, so we're just going to append whatever's less left to the end of the list. Now, we can do that because we know that whatever's left in a list must be larger than everything else that was in the other list. And because it's sorted, it must be larger than everything else that was in the same list. So now we know it's larger than everything else in both lists, so we can safely put it at the end of our output list. All right, so let's take that idea and write the merge function. So of course, we're going to define our merge function to take two lists, and it's going to return the output list. And remember, this is just a helper function. This is something we need to build up our larger solutions from smaller ones. Next, we're going to look at the actual recursive merge sort that uses this function. All right. So we're going to define our output list, initialize it to be empty. And we're going to begin our while loop. So this while loop checks to see whether either one of the lists is empty. Remember, we're using our AND operation here. So if either one of its um, operands is true, then the while loop will continue. As long as both lists uh, have elements in them, so they're non-zero length, we'll continue going through the loop. All right, the first thing we do in our loop is a comparison. We check to see whether the beginning, so the zero position of list one, and the beginning of list two, um, we compare to see which one is larger. That's the same as our, it's like our min function that we had in um, the walkthrough of our example. All right, so if L1 is smaller, then this is true, and we append L10 to the output. And then I'm going to remove the first element of L1, just like we did in our walkthrough, uh, so that it has a new beginning element that we can check. All right. So this is the case in our if statement where L1, 0 is less than L2, 0. And then we do the same thing when L2, um, is, is L2, 0 is less than L1, 0. That's our else case. We append L2, 0. We strip off the first element of L2, 0. And then we're done. All that remains is to return this output list we built. And I'm using a little bit of convenience of, of Python syntax here. Remember how we added whatever was left in the non-empty list to the output? That's what this plus L1 plus L2 does. Now, one or more of these L1, L2 lists is going to be empty. But it's perfectly fine to add an empty list to a list. That doesn't change the, the list at all, right? So if output plus, let's say L1 and L2 are both empty, if I added um, L1 and L2 to output, I would just get output back because these lists are empty. 
If L1 is empty, but L2 has something in it, then I just could output with L2's elements in it. And the same if L1 is has something in it and L2 is empty. So this is just appending whatever was left in um, L1 or L2. All right, so this function is not too bad, right? So it's just a while loop with one if statement where we do a comparison here, and then we return the output list. All right, so now that we have this merge function to help us, let's start writing merge sort. All right, so merge sort is gonna take a list to be sorted. The first thing we do is check for a base case. So if the length of the list is equal to one, then we're just gonna return the list, right? So this is, this always amazes me, right? So that merge sort at this point is going to sort the list by just returning the list because a list of one element is already sorted. And we're gonna build our whole algorithm that, on that assumption. All right, so the next thing we do, this is the base case, we just return the list. There's no sorting here at all because it's already sorted. Next, we're going to figure out how to divide up um, our list into smaller pieces, just like we did with binary search. So the first thing we do is we set the midpoint. So we're going to take the length of the list, do integer division here, remember, so we get an integer back, so it's a legitimate, um, uh, legitimate length for the list. We don't want to have decimals here when we're trying to divide up our list. Then we're going to call merge sort that's everything before that midpoint, and then call merge sort on everything after that that um, that midpoint. Right. So merge sort here and merge sort here are going to be operating on lists that are half the size, and then they're going to return sorted lists. This is where our merge function comes in because when merge sort returns the sorted first half of the um, original L, and then the second call to merge sort returns the sorted second half, we're gonna merge those sorted lists into one list with merge. Remember, merge just requires to have um, two sorted lists, and it returns a, a combination of those lists that's also sorted. But I wanna pause here for just a second. This is the whole program. This is all of merge sort. So the merge function wasn't too complicated, and then there's no comparisons here, there's no sorting really going on, except for just calling merge sort on half of the list. So this really demonstrates the power of recursion. Um, that we can just assume that the, this half of the list is sorted by merge sort all the way down until we get to a single element, which is trivially already sorted. All right, so let's start thinking about how fast merge sort runs. So remember with bubble sort that we decided to use the comparison operator as our measure of work being done. So we're gonna count how many comparisons are happening to determine how long it takes or how, many, how much work it takes to solve um, the problem for a given list size. And we're gonna do the same thing here with merge sort. It's always important to use the same measure of work so we're comparing apples to apples. So, our comparison, one of our only comparisons that happens, is in the merge function. Um, and it's right here. So we're going to check to see whether L1 0 and the first element of L2, we're going to check which one is bigger. That's our comparison. That's really all the work that's happening to sort this list. So we're going to keep track of how many times that happens. Well, in merge sort, this is just a while loop. It's a while loop that iterates over the length of the list that's been given. So we should already be able to see that um, for a list here of size n, it's gonna take order n time or order n comparisons to um, merge these two lists. All right, let's take a look at the merge sort part of this um, function. So we're gonna try and figure out 
how many times do we call merge? Because the number of times we call merge is going to tell us how many times do we get those n comparisons for each merge call. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So we call merge twice each time we go through the merge fork function. So we are doubling the number of merge calls we make, but we're only calling merge sort on half the list. So we're having the size of n. So we're doubling the number of times merge gets called, and we're having the number of times, uh, sorry, we're having the length of the list that merge has to work on. So I think you may already be able to see that we're doing twice the work, but then having the work. So we're just getting n, right? So we're going to look in detail at how this works, but at each recursive call, we're going to do n work, where n here is the size of the original input list. All right. So let's go through this in depth. Let's take an example. Um, so here's L, which has four elements unsorted. We're going to sort them. There are four elements in this list, so n is four. Each of these merge sort calls is going to generate two more merge sort calls inside of the recursive function call. All right, but only half the list is passed in. So now we have two elements um, for the lower half of the list, two elements in the upper half of the list. So now we have our n for this level is going to be two plus two equals four and so on. So we subdivide the problem again until we get to our base case. So now we have one element here on five, one element three, one element seven, one element six. So now we have one plus one plus one plus one is four. And what, was, what we're seeing is that at every level, the size of the list being processed is the same. And therefore the number of comparisons we call at each level is the same. It's always going to be n. It's always going to be 4 for this particular problem at each level. All right, so our, our next question is, if we're going to do n comparisons, if n is the size of the list at each level, how many levels are they going to be for this program? Um, and by the way, this is called a call tree. It's a little bit hard to see right now, but this is sort of branching like a tree. If you imagine it turned upside down, um, it would look a little bit like a branching tree. All right, let's get rid of a lot of this detail. It's hard to see the tree structure with that. So these are just the recursive calls. We're doubling each time. I'm going to try and figure out how many um, of these levels do we have for a particular input size. If there are eight elements in our list. We're going to have three levels to our tree. And we can see how many elements were in the original problem because remember we bottom out at having a single element. So if I just count up the, um, the endpoints here in this tree, which we call leaves, by the way, if we count up these leaves, we see there are eight of them. So there must have been eight inputs. There must have been eight um, elements in the original input list. And there are three levels. All right, let's look at the next stage. All right, if we doubled the size of the list, now we have 16 elements. We only have four um, levels. And we know a function like that. We've looked at that already for binary search. The function that describes um, how many times do you need to divide a problem in half before you get to a single element is the log function, log base two. All right, let's check that. So log base two of one, and log base two is one. So we have one level if we had just um, a list of size two. We'd have two levels if we had n equals to four, so a list of size four. We can have three levels when there are eight, and four levels when there are 16. Now you might wonder what happens if I don't have nice even um, powers of two here for my list size. It just means it'll run slightly more quickly. It means um, one of these branches we call it the tree, one of these branches will not be symmetrical. It won't have quite as many leaves. All right. But that doesn't really affect our runtime analysis because 
remember we're looking at what's the worst case running time. And so if it does slightly better because the, um, the list size wasn't a power of two, that's fine. All right, so our conclusion is if there are n comparisons at each level and there are log base two n total levels, then the total number of comparisons is gonna be log two n times n, right? So we're gonna call merge log base two of n times and each time we call merge, we do n comparisons. So we just multiply those together and we get log uh, n log n. And that explains why merge sort is order n log n time complexity. Time complexity is just another term for uh, how much work is being done, how long does it take to solve a problem. All right. So here's another visualization. Um, you can find it on YouTube from Music Combo. Um, in this case, the height of each element here indicates its value. So before we saw bars, now it's just the, the, the Y value is the, the value um, of the data point we're sorting, and the X value is its position in the list that we're sorting. So on this side of the screen, we are going to use bubble sort. Remember, it's order n squared. And on this side, we're going to use uh, merge sort. And the first thing you should notice is a lot more points we're going to merge here with merge sort than on bubble sort. Um, we're, only, we're only sorting 200 numbers with bubble sort. It would take too long otherwise for, for this demo. Um, and 2,000 numbers for merge sort. All right, so let's get those started. And what's interesting is you can see the structure of how it's solving this problem, how merge sort sorts each half of the list um, before moving on to the next, whereas bubble sort, remember, is running through the whole list each time. So it sort of gradually bubbles up the highest values to the front. So we were able to sort 2,000 numbers here with merge sort actually faster than or about the same amount of time as it took for bubble sort to serve to sort just 200 numbers. All right, our next lecture is going to be on quick sort. I'm going to end this video here. I uh, hope to see you in the interactive lectures and stay healthy and I'll see you later. Bye bye.